and we're live. Yay. Hi everyone. Welcome to another STEM Women Hangout on Air. Today our guest is Professor Julia Greer and she's a material scientist and she'll tell us all about her work. So jumping right in, as we do, Julia, can you tell us a bit more about what it means to be a material scientist and what you currently do? Absolutely. Hi everyone, whoever's here. So I'm a material scientist, which means that I generally study the behavior of materials, solid materials generally, and um, specifically their response to mechanical perturbations. So if we were to, say, apply a certain load or strain a material in a particular direction, what we would like to know is what other processes are taking place um, concurrently and also what is actually happening at the atomic level within these materials. Generally, um, in our group, we do... Uh, we dedicate our efforts to research on nanoscale and nanomaterials, but um, at the fundamental level, but with the aim of building materials up, sort of a bottom-up bottom type of a construction. And is that what you're currently working on? Oh my gosh, we work on so many diverse topics because we basically use these nanoscale constituents to create larger materials. So there's such a wide range of microstructure. So we call these, um, the atomic arrangements within a material are called a microstructure. And depending if it's a crystal material where the atoms are ordered in a particular way versus an amorphous material where you have a basically pockets of free volume where the atoms don't, don't really have any short range or long range order, what, um, there, there's a variety of these microstructures. And so it's the interplay between the dimensions within the microstructure and the actual dimensions of the material that give rise to these unique properties. And when you construct these nano-building so-called blocks into an architecture, which then you can model from the mechanical point of view, you have a combination of a structure and a material, but we do everything at such a small scale that it's, it's really not so clear how to discern a structure from the material. So we effectively make metamaterials, so-called materials where the overall properties are not only governed by their atomic arrangements, but by the combination of a microstructure, the nano size, and the type of the material. And so we use these, these types of architectures towards many different applications, for example, um, as battery electrodes. So we're working on these um, structures as very, very lightweight and very strong and stiff, robust electrodes, which can be made out of active media. We also use these architectures to construct three-dimensional cellular scaffolds where you can effectively guide the growth and the population of the cells, for example, bone, human bone um, type cells, into particular locations with the aim of differentiating and then creating organs which are not going to be artificial, but, but uh, they will actually, the body will regenerate them. We're just helping them by creating um, these scaffolds. Of course, there are structural applications in the sense that these are very strong materials, and uh, um, in part because they, are, they have nanometer dimensions. So using these nanometer dimensions enables us to, to control their mechanical properties, for example, how they break or how strong they are. And when, that, uh, when we utilize that so-called size effect in materials, we can then proliferate it onto larger materials and start making useful structures out of it. Like, for example, three-dimensional photonic crystals, and um, et cetera. So that's what, those have been the more exciting pursuits in my group right now, is basically using these fundamental studies of the nanomaterials that we have we and others have garnered so far, and then applying them towards creating new materials. So you mentioned a couple of applications of your work. What might be some of the other uses, um, maybe in the long term, that people might expect from your work? Well, like I mentioned some of them already, for example, as battery electrodes. So lithium, um, lithium ion batteries and lithium air batteries have less so for lithium air. Um, have been a, a, a holy grail, I would say, of the energy storage community. And so, wouldn't we all? Wouldn't it be great if we all had very, very lightweight, powerful cars, which um, weigh next to nothing, or just as powerful and run on battery, of course, right? So everyone needs. Um, everyone would love to have these batteries that have very lightweight electrodes that are just as efficient. So for that, you need a very high surface area to volume ratio. So people have been using these very porous materials. So what our materials are able to do is we can architect them in such a way that they're also mechanically robust. And so with that, you can come, you know, comes the reliability, chemical stability, and the mechanical stability. So in many of these applications, even though the mechanical stability is of secondary importance, they're still 
um, it's still a very serious consideration because you don't want your device to fail. Mm. Right? Then mm. also implantable biomedical devices, so for a pacemaker or even an implantable battery. So with the development of other technologies, for example, wireless power um, sources, what one can do is now develop these, or what we can do is develop these very small um, features and devices that can be implanted directly into the body, into the human body, that you can activate uh, wirelessly. So you don't have to extract these things from the body or, you know, and put, put them back inside because the, the power source is now going to be external somewhere and will be able to activate things inside. So um, there are many different, there are many different um, applications. There's also, um, for the three-dimensional photonic crystals, we already have some preliminary results on that, and at least in the IR range, you can very clearly see how the photonic response, photonic band gap, changes with strain. So what that means is that we can uh, design ultra-precise optical switches, for example, or um, strain gauges. So you can put a diagnostic tool on, um, on an airplane wing, for example, so that it's for a non-destructive evaluation. So you'll be able to tell the health of your material, how close it is to breaking, for example, by using these very precise um, high-frequency strain gauges. It's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> So what actually made you interested in nanomaterials in the first place and what led you to your career path? Well, it's funny you should ask because my undergraduate degree is actually in chemical engineering. And in chemical engineering, people generally work with mm -hmm. liquids and gases. <laughs> and then I completely mm -hmm. switched to solids. So I ended mm -hmm. up doing, uh, between my undergraduate degree and my graduate school, I ended up doing a year-long internship at Intel. And so I became a material scientist. So in materials, people generally, for the most part, study the behavior of the solids. And when I, um, I did my, my graduate studies at Stanford, and there was some interest in the mechanical properties of materials, and they had just bought a new toy, the so-called toy. It's called a focused ion beam, or a FIP. And um, when, th when that happens, wh when that happened, when the, um, they acquired this instrument, we actually were the, among the first ones to go explore and to... Um, start making these small samples. And when we started making these small samples, it was just so enabling and so empowering to start making these very, very small structures ourselves. And I guess with that came the, the ability to create my own structures brought in the interest in the nanomaterials. So it's a little bit backwards because most people first learn about the nanoscience, nanomaterials, and then explore it, whereas we first made them. And then we discovered there are actually all these very interesting properties. And um, up to that point, not too many people actually were studying specifically the mechanical properties of these crystals. And it turns out there was such a wealth of information and a wealth of discovery and phenomena that we could um, we could learn about. You know, that was a surprise. That was a dis discovery. So, mm. yeah. And so, so that's how long is it? It was basically a switch. You know, when I worked at Intel, and there were there were you know the microelectronics uh, industry was very concerned with mechanical properties in metals specifically. So it was very. Um, it was a natural continuation, I guess. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I guess mm -hmm. you get asked this question a lot, but could you tell us um, more about your time working at Intel in industry versus academia, where you currently are at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, would you like me to compare them or how I felt about each one of them? Yeah. You know, I, I'm I have just to very say, curious I'm, about that. I am the kind of person who basically just makes the best of the situation no matter I I generally am a very positive person so I enjoyed both experiences I am happy to comment on what for me personally what mm -hmm. some of the more exciting aspects and some of the less um, I guess desirable aspects of each so I went to work in industry I actually worked in industry two and a half times I would say because the first time I was an Intel at intern in Santa Clara um, an intern at Intel in Santa Clara. Then I was a real person, and I worked in um, Intel mask operations department at Intel. And then I did my postdoc at Park at the Palo Alto Research Center. And so that's kind of like a half industrial type of a place. So when I was very young and I did this internship, I wasn't really given any real responsibility. So being in industry was really great because I was exposed to real deadlines, real product. But I worked in, in um, a research and development type of an environment. So it was just fun. I would say I got to learn a lot of really new, um, a lot of really new things at a very fast pace, but without really being given a lot of responsibility. So I really enjoyed it. The second time when I worked at Intel, 
I was a real person, you know, with a master's degree. So I worked as an integration engineer. And so what I learned at that time was that in industry, a lot of the decisions are driven by business. So it's the culture and the environment of business-driven um, approach. So if something didn't work and you managed to fix it, that was the end of that story and you just move forward. And there wasn't so much interest in understand, in trying to understand why didn't things work, you know, or how we're going to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So uh, it was a lot of the firefighting mode. So a lot, a lot of the of my activities involved something was wrong. We had to go straight to the, you know, accident site or whatever the problem was, and then fix it, which was a little bit satisfying, and then move on. So we were never really given the freedom or the permission to really investigate anything in depth because that wasn't what um, Intel was after. And also, there was always somebody telling me what to do, and I didn't like that very much, you know. So um, at Park, it was a little bit different, but the, but it's still very business driven. So it was still the culture where I wasn't exactly driving my own interests or my own research, and it was it was empowering in the sense that the access to the equipment was fantastic, the pace was very fast, um, but things were moving in a very prescribed way. So I didn't feel like I was very satisfied intellectually and also I wasn't didn't feel like I was very intellectually challenged um, in the position that I was in. Now that I'm in academia and I get to work with tremendous people and have tremendous access to um, resource, resources in terms of both the intellectual power and I fly all over the world. I mean I'm serving on the global agenda for for um, um, nanotechnologies. I'm flying out to Dubai. This is a part of my involvement in the World Economic Forum. I'm going to be, I'm serving on this Global Agenda Council for um, basically where is nanotechnology going with people like Bob Langer and George Whitesides and just tremendous people. So the access to the intellectual power, and I work at Caltech where we have I think something like 30, 32 Nobel laureates or something like that, and there are 300 faculty members. So over 10% of our faculty members here are Nobel laureates. We have people in the national academies. Um, and basically, the culture is such that I walk into my office and I might have a voicemail from, you know, Ahmed Zawail or somebody, or Bob Grubbs. These are all Nobel laureates in chemistry who say, oh, Julie, I have this idea. Would you mind walking over and, and you know, chatting about it? And that's how research is born. And so it's really invigorating in the sense that not only do we have to the freedom to do what we want to do, but we drive we drive it, and and with that comes comes the creativity. So I felt like maybe my industrial years weren't as conducive to being creative, but um, the um, but the you know the academic freedom of it is is what um, what's really empowering. You bring up a good point about creativity, um, you've, because we know there's lots of narrow stereotypes about what scientists are. It's just you know people wearing white lab coats and hiding in a basement somewhere. And yet, you know, you you play the piano, and you've said that it helps you be more creative scientifically. Just having this outlet. Can you address some of the stereotypes of scientists by telling us how your extracurricular activities inspire your research? Yeah, absolutely. So. All the extracurricular activities basically guide um, a, a human being, right? So we are scientists in the sense that we think, right? So this is this may not be something that people are generally aware of, but what the scientists do, I mean, we spend a lot of time working in the lab, of course, um, and we all have graduate students and postdocs who are in, um, in the lab there with us. But what we ultimately do is we solve problems and we think about them, right? And we think about them in a way that this is what shapes us into who we are. We, we think about them in a particular way, and this is probably we do what we do, right? That's what drives us. So to do that, you kind of have to be a whole, complete person. And, and all of these extracurricular things, like, for example, I love music, right? And so I play the piano a lot, and I love role winning and hiking and interacting with people. So all of these experiences and all of these aspects aspects of my life and I'm sure everyone else's life form who you are and some people you know thrive on working all the time some people thrive on being outdoors some of the time whatever it is but whatever shapes you into who you are makes you a more complete person and from that comes uh, a better scientist right and so there are very few stereotypes for scientists that are left now all the research has become so interdisciplinary it's very um, it's very difficult to define the sharp uh, dividing lines between 
what a material scientist does versus what an applied physicist does versus what a mechanical engineer might do versus what an aerospace person was, would do or a chemical engineer. So it used to be that all of these disciplines were much more defined in a classical sense, but now a lot of this of these boundaries have become gray just because, especially in the nanoscale, especially in the nanoscience, so much um, there's so much involvement from uh, from from say microscopy and for nanoscience specifically could be an electrical engineer working on the devices, a microscopist working on the atomic makeup, a material scientist working on the specific part of the material, and a mechanical engineer that's working on how does it all fit together, right? So it's a team, it's very interdisciplinary. And so with that, I think that's particularly conducive to having um, these extracurricular activities where you're used to thinking from a different perspective. And so it really helps in working with teams of people, which is becoming more and more of a reality of, of any scientific discipline right now. Absolutely, and your work sounds incredibly interdisciplinary. I mean, yeah, um, it's really. I yeah. actually, what's really amazing is that. So, what makes anyone, any scientist, I think, what shapes any scientist or professor in particular, is their students, their students and the postdocs. And so, I have an amazing group, which consists of chemical engineering students, aeronautics students, mechanical engineering students, um, material science students. I have a couple of chemistry um, people. So it's a very diverse group, and and they really teach me a lot. I think um, I, I think that that's one thing that, as you're saying, the public doesn't really understand how increasingly to, to answer really important questions, we do have to become more interdisciplinary. And um, it's great talking to you to hear about how you're blending all these different traditions together in such an exciting field. Thank you. <laughs> so um, if there are young girls uh, and young uh, women students out there listening, how might they, um, what might they have to think about in order to follow a similar career path as yourself? Oh my gosh, don't follow my career path. Uh, <laughs> I, would say, I would say that what's more important for the younger, I think what's really important is that we as a society, and especially us professors, inspire the girls to consider a career in academia. I would say, you know, young girls don't really probably think about their career so much as they think about what's fun for them to do, you know, and what are we how am I going to make a difference in this world, right? It seems like a lot of the young girls and, and, well, just young people in general, when they're considering things that they're going to do, I mean, certainly they think about their career, but it's such so removed from where they are in their lives, you know, when they're 12 or 13 or something like that. Certainly it's different in high school. But even in college, I mean, you don't really think about the career yet because you don't really know what that means. So what I would say, hmm. the most important thing is sort of to carry through in your life from the early years at all times is to follow your passion. It's really important to trust your gut feeling and if something appeals to you, if something is fun, you should do it. You know, and sometimes we meet a lot of resistance in our lives because we're programmed to listen to some figures of authority. We're very much programmed to listen to our parents, to our mentors, to our teachers, right? That sometimes we um, stifle that impulse to do something that we think is exciting. You know, we, sometimes we might stifle our own curiosity because we think that that will please someone. So I, um, I would encourage all the young girls that if you meet an inspiring person or if you get engaged in an inspiring project, by all means you should follow it, you know, become obsessed. Um, follow that passion, you know, because you learn. I mean, I used to love gardening and plants. I mean, I still wish I could do all that, you know, but there are different things in life that you think will never be connected, but what you learn is the sense of discovery. What you learn is a sense of discipline. What you learn is time management. That's like, so I have these two young girls, which I'm sure we'll talk about eventually. And so ever since I became a parent, my whole world, you know, has changed. But each experience in life that you're passionate about really shapes you into who you become later. And so I would say to the young girls, the most important thing is follow your passion, ask questions, and don't be afraid to speak out. That's the most important thing. If you have a question, raise your hand and ask it, because if you don't ask it, no one's going to stick up for you. So if you really, you really kind of need to learn how to be self-sufficient and independent from the very early um, age, and I would say if you have an incredible mentor, that's a rare opportunity, and those are far and few in between. So, so if you meet an inspiring person, do whatever it takes to, to sort of um, 
to be with them. You know, you know, if there is somebody that's inspiring, and if there's something that's inspiring that you do that you particularly enjoy, by all means, you should really follow it and ask questions and be curious and um, you know, don't be afraid. And certainly get an internship. So for the young girls that are actually in high school, you know, like a more pra this is more philosophical advice, but from a more practical point of view, absolutely get an internship. If you're interested, even if you don't know what science is, the most important thing is go and try it out. You know, for mm -hmm. all of these things, there are so many internship opportunities uh, in industry and in academia. So I would say it it's such an invaluable experience to just go and experience, you know, working in the lab being surrounded by scientists, seeing how scientists think. Because more often than not, I think people are unaware of what science means, of what it means to work in a lab, you know, and just like you said, these stereotypes, which hopefully we're breaking now, you know, but you really have, in a lab, there's, there are no answers in the, answer the, in the back of the book. So when you go to really work on a scientific problem, you don't know what the right answer is, and your mentor may not either. And so you really get to be involved and engaged in research, which means that we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And giving yourself that permission to not know what the right answer is, being giving yourself this permission to be wrong, I don't know too many fields besides the science where that's possible. You know, we're allowed to make mistakes, and that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So you, you mentioned that you have um, two young girls. How, how do you manage the work-life balance and address this redundant idea that women can't both be mothers and successful in STEM? You know, it's really sad and frustrating to me that there's this opinion out there because, you know what, we do it. And I have, in fact, I just went on a hike with these amazing women, with three of my colleagues. I went with Frances Arnold, who is... I believe she's one of very few women, if not the only woman, who is in all three national academies in the U.S. And um, with Pamela Bjorkman and with Marianne Bronner, they're all moms and they're all amazing scientists. And they're, I mean, and there's so many role models that I have, I mean, that I absolutely aspire to. The thing is this, there will never be a good time to have kids, or rather, there will always be a reason not to. So if at some point you want to become a mom, you just have to do it, you know, and I have to say, Knowing what I know now, I, would, I wouldn't wish this. Uh, it, it's a fantastic experience. It's hard. It's frustrating. It's exhilarating. It's empowering. It completely changes your world forever, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So manage, time management is the one. Th so I would say this. If you're not a parent, you don't know the definition of the word tired or the word busy. These things have a completely new meaning when you become a parent. So, but... What they also teach you is how to manage your time in a much more productive way. They teach you a lot. So I would say I am a, such a much better person because I have these girls, and I like myself much better because of them. So it's one of those things that they, they teach you so much about yourself. Patience is another one of those things. You know, that you, um, you really benefit. It's, sometimes it's hard to see the benefits, but you really benefit from being so engaged in their lives. I, I'm a bit of a tiger mom. So I'm very involved in their lives. So, you know, I take them to ice skating classes and to swimming classes. And I do, I interact with them a lot. And we spend a lot of time together just interacting. But that's the most precious thing that I've ever experienced. I mean, that amount of trust and that amount, you, you know, I represent the world to them. And it's my responsibility, my duty. But it's something much deeper than that to teach them about the world. And it's like I've been giving this gift to do that. And I wouldn't trade that for the world. And so with that comes, okay, so I wouldn't trade that. So I don't work during the time when I spend with my kids. You know, so between, actually, unfortunately, it's shifting to closer towards four. I was going to say between five and eight. But now it's more like between four and nine. Um, I spend a lot of time with my kids. And we actually have a very strong parental network at Caltech. So I have um, a lot more kids than just two that I usually interact with. And um, I just, I mean, everybody around me knows that between four and nine, I don't really work. I mean, I may be thinking about things but I don't really work, you know, but that means that I don't waste time. What that means is that for all of my other activities, I think more productively, you know, I delegate more to my students. I let them be more independent, you know. Um, it fluctuates, of course, right? So there are times when I'm more involved in the children's lives and less, uh, I mean, sorry, more involved in my students' lives, I didn't mean children, um, and less involved in a particular project, right? So my students, um, when they become more independent, that, that always helps a lot, you know. But that's just basically having kids requires a lot of time and, and it's a very intense emotional experience so you just if you're already a passionate person you're you know constantly giving it of course it's intense you know so you have to make choices and you have to prioritize your activities and don't waste time 
I would say what I learned a lot is, is you know, if I have between 9 and 10.30 to perform a certain thing, I do that. You know, like I don't waste time. Like I don't Facebook. I don't hang out with people during that time. You know, I certainly do other in, during other times. But if I have a deadline and I have to do it, you know, I just do it. So I don't say, well, I just don't feel, you know, I'm tired. I'm not going to do it. And I also don't sleep. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, but I do work a lot, and, and you know it really helps to love what you do. So. And so, what? Um, how do you think that academia might actually be a little bit more supportive of um, working mothers, and, and particularly in STEM? That's actually a very good point that you bring up. I would say I'm extremely grateful to all the trailblazers and all the amazing women who paved the way for us, because I think that it's so much easier in academia now than it was even 10 years ago, and particularly 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there were hardly any women in academia, and they really had to struggle. And being pregnant had a lot of stigma associated with it, and there have been so many outspoken um, speeches, you, you know, people out there who basically said, you know what, if you're a mom, you can't do good science. You just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I've been told by an advisor at Stanford, actually, saying, you know what, you're you're not a good scientist and women in general shouldn't get PhDs. I mean, I've experienced all that firsthand. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard colleagues say, you know, you're just here because you're a girl and stuff like that. And you just have to get over it. You know what, in the end, they're going to look like a, a mean person. And so you just kind of have to, like, an, I'm not sure what kind of words I'm allowed to use on, the, on this broadcast. <laughs> but you can fill in your own thing. Um, you just kind of, you have to be above that. So now universities are particularly adaptable and amenable to um, family life, I would say. So, for example, one example in the U.S. is that our tenure process is such that for each child that you have during your tenure process, up to two, you have a year added to your tenure clock. So, I would say the most important um, evaluation that you will go through as a person in academia is your tenure uh, decision. Because if you get tenured, you have a job for life. If you don't get tenured, you're done. It's effectively being fired. And that's, that has a bit of a uh, negative connotation. Um, to it, and so for women, especially for women and for men, actually that have uh, babies throughout their tenure clock, you automatically add two years, and so it really, um, it really helps. We definitely have very flexible hours. So I used I used to joke, and I said something like, "Yeah, of course our hours are flexible as long as you work 24/7." So <laughs> what that means is that I am my own boss. I don't really, none of us really have um, have bosses. It might be particularly, uh, particularly at Caltech, but less in general academic professors. We don't really have bosses, which means that we generally get to dictate our schedule and be in control of our schedule. Um, so um, so what that means is that we make we make choices about when we do certain um, things. So there's no one watching over my shoulder, you know, saying, oh, you shouldn't be here. So I absolutely can take my children to a swimming class at 5 o'clock or to a gymnastics class at 4 o'clock, you know, as long as my work shows that I'm being really productive. So mm -hmm. I would say that the tenure part and the flexibility, um, and also this is this I would so I'm about to bring up these aspects have been very nice and supportive, and and the society in general has bought into it. But there is one, I would say, one thing that I wish were done better, and some universities are much better at this than others, and that is the childcare centers. So mm -hmm. we are particularly um, great. Uh, well, I'm really grateful, but we're particularly lucky. Here at Caltech, we have an amazing preschool right here on campus. It's called Caltech's Children's Center, the CCC, as we lovingly call it. And this is where I, I was mentioning this parental network. So most of the professors that are my age have young kids in it. And so we're all very close. The professors, the parents are very close, and the children are really close. But it's very hard to get into it. And it's also expensive. And so I think more often than not, the people, the specifically the working mothers, are having a really hard time enrolling their children in the um, child care centers, and that that would be so tremendously helpful, and that would be amazing if there was no two-year waiting list, you know, and if it were easy to get into these child care centers, and if they were, you know, affordable, that would be really good. Absolutely, that that's fascinating, and it, it's really great that you have that strong support network because I think that goes a long way towards making life mm -hmm. easier. You don't feel like you're on your own. Exactly. I would say, sorry, can I add to that? So I wish there were more child, child care centers or providers of some sort here at Caltech. I wish that, or, or sorry, at universities. I also wish one thing that would be really great is if um, we go to a lot of conferences. So one, one thing that I would say is the hardest about my job is all the traveling. I travel a lot. So I was in Shanghai two weeks ago. I'm going to the East Coast and then to, um, to Maine and then to Hong Kong, all in the span of 
a week. You know, I never leave my kids for more than three days. So I travel frequently, but for very short spans of time. And I'm going to Dubai and Singapore. I mean, there are a lot of conferences. And I really wish I could bring my kids with me. And I used, I mean, I, I do sometimes. But it's very challenging to find um, any kind of uh, childcare during these conferences. So, for example, I did that. I took um, Ayla, so my six year old daughter is Ayla. I took her to the MRS, this is Materials Research Society, it's the biggest materials conference in San Francisco. And they said that they uh, provided uh, childcare. And what it was, it was just a hotel room, right? So I left my kid in a stuffy hotel room for the entire day. You know, and I was walking down the stairs and I could hear the mommy, you know. Screaming, and so that really—I mean, when they say they provide childcare, it really shouldn't be a little room in some hotel, you know, where they don't go outside and something like that. So that would be—I think—that would be really helpful. And this is not just for working moms. This is for moms and dads. This is for any professional yeah. person. Um, we constantly get asked, you know, how do you do the work-life balance? Well, you know, we would love to be able to bring our kids with us. So, you know, if there was a little cash pot of money, it's not like it's expensive. You know, if you give us twenty thousand dollars per year on the flights, you know, where we can bring our kids with us. You know, we'll be able to stay for the whole conference. Yeah. You know, if I the reason why I never stay at any conference for a week is because well, it's because I have to get back to these kids. You know, if you if um, people were to provide us with resources and the permission to travel with kids, I think it would be um, a, a lot better for everyone. Absolutely. We're um, mm -hmm. pretty much out of time, but uh, do you have any last words to add to um, our conversation? You know, if there, I would say I just hope that um, if anyone out there is considering doing science, you know, or is curious and doesn't know how to start, there's so many resources on the web. I would say absolutely go to your local university, go to your library, go on Google, go on Gmail, um, and just find, like, for example, this amazing stemwomen.net thing that I'm doing right now. You know, there's so many resources out there. Out there just don't be afraid. You know, if, if, if you're curious, you, you just got to do it. You know, and there's so many resources out there that there's really no excuse. And um, I just really wish that more more girls were exposed to these resources and took these opportunities. And I'm, I always host so many high school students. Oh, my God, my lab is exploding. Undergraduate students <laughs> and high school students, you know, uh, people who come over and we show off these, um, these uh, amazing results that my students are generating. You know, I think it's inspiring. And so, if, you know, if I could inspire some young girls to come and consider a career in academia, you know, and, or maybe not a career, but to just become a scientist, you know, I did my job well. So. Mm. I especially like that you're mentioning that you host high school students. I think that's another, yeah. um, we've heard a few women say that to us, but it's something that's not promoted enough. So Absolutely. There are a lot of high school students and they're so capable and they're so smart and they're actually a tremendous asset to any lab. I mean, they're a little bit of a you, you know, I mean, it take work because they don't know anything yet, right? But like, it's we all used to be high school students who didn't know anything, you know. And I had these internships when I was an undergraduate student, and I learned a lot through them, you know. So, mm -hmm. so absolutely, I think that a lot more labs should do that, and we do that. We do that at Caltech a lot. So I, I really hope that um, whoever, you know, that more and more students do it, especially girl students. Wonderful. Thanks for your time, Julia. Absolutely. Um, I really enjoyed really... this. Thank you so much for this invitation. This is this is really terrific. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really fun and very enlightening, I think, um, in, in all of the practical advice you've given us. Um, Absolutely. So um, just as a wrap-up um, to let our viewers know, next uh, we'll be hosting our next Hangout in a fortnight, and we're talking with Dr. Inga Newburn, who's the Director of Research Training at the Australian National University, but she's more, uh, she's better known internationally as um, the Thesis Whisperer. Uh, she's going to talk to us about her research on the gendered experiences of PhD students as they navigate, navigate their relationships with their supervisors and how they manage university administration. So that's in uh, two weeks' time. And until then, have a great time, everyone. Thanks. Thank you Thank for joining you so us. Bye.